You're listening to The Dope Experience with Romby Bryant, Javier Collins, and Sal Vergara. Our conversations revolve around people looking to evolve and transform into the next phase of their lives. We're here to help them navigate this journey by developing one's perspective every day. You're listening to The Dope Experience. Welcome back to those who joined us for the first show, and a big welcome to those who are listening to us for the first time. Our dope topic for today is code switching. Invited a good friend of ours to the show, Mr. Randy Wilson. Uh, Randy is the Vice President and Director of Organizational Development uh, at First United Bank. He's also held multiple leadership roles at uh, various companies, including Pier One, Cox Communications, uh, Selenese, and MD Anderson, and a small box retail store you might have heard of, Walmart. Uh, his roles have focused on uh, different areas in which we'll talk about today. Um, and we'd be remiss uh, to not acknowledge or uh, talk about the social discourse that's been happening over the past few weeks. And we asked Randy to join in the conversation uh, to discuss our topic today, code switching. Yeah, so that's a uh, very good, very good uh, conversation starter, especially for the day and age that we're in. Um, so just my understanding and randy you're going to shed some light on this for us so my understanding with uh code switching is that uh, originally it's a phenomenon that was uh created out of uh, linguistics as a way to describe uh, how people uh change languages uh mid-sentence or during a conversation which is really interesting uh given that today it has grown to involve uh ethnicity nationality it has grown to involve how someone dresses. It has even grown to involve someone's uh, sexual orientation uh, in the workplace. So, um, yeah, please let's uh, let's hop in uh, and I'd love to hear some feedback and and some some perspective on uh, on this important issue. Randy, the first question that we have for you, from your perspective over the years and through your uh, various roles. What have you seen in terms of the prevalence of the need to code switch? And do you think it impacts a certain demographic more than others? Well, first of all, thank you guys for having me. This is a really great opportunity to talk about a topic that I think um, not a lot of people know or talk about. So I think it's interesting that you guys brought in a really relevant topic. This, this idea of code switching in my mind has such um, deep history. I, I think that, you know, when you start talking about, you know, where the origins of it were, you know, it's, it's around this notion of linguistics, right? So people who are studying sociology or studying cultures and, and, and tribes and, and different types of, of, of ethnic groups, you know, the use of code switching was essentially started as a way uh, for people to communicate um, in, a, in, a, in a way that within that tribe or within that group, people understood. Um, and, and the idea of code switching was when you started to integrate these different types of people, right? So you fast forward to today, and the idea of code switching really becomes more associated with um, the way people interact and the way people talk, particularly minority groups, you know, when they are uh, within their own tribes, if you will. And, and then what happens when they come into sort of the 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 mainstream part of what we know as um, mainstream America or mainstream corporate America. Um, and certainly in this context, you can look at it at a global level and say, is there sort of a global corporate aspect of it? And there absolutely is. Um, but there is this, this idea, you know, to sell to your question about, you know, today and how do we see it uh, in, in, in the workplace today? I, you know, when I worked for Continental Airlines years ago, um, the question that I asked was, you know, what happens when a, an American plane flies to India or flies to Southeast Asia? Are the air traffic controllers speaking in the native language there? And how do the pilots know? And the pilot said, no, the universal language is English, right? So if you're a pilot in Southeast Asia, you have to know how to speak English, even if you're flying from one point in Southeast Asia to another point in Southeast Asia. The air traffic controllers and the pilots are all speaking English, right? So it's very important that there's this universal language that people can identify with. So foundationally, it's English. When you think about code switching, that suggests that there's a dominant language that some subcultures have to assimilate to 
in order to be able to get along. And it's the same sort of thing, right? So this idea about code switching is a way for people who are not in their comfort level, right? Or in their comfort, comfortable place, you know, this, uh, uh, this place where they can speak the way they normally speak, right? Which is a shortcut in communication, right? Um, it, they go into this environment that's more um, uh, that that's more standard, right? And what we're used to, right? In our culture, right? Our black culture, our Hispanic culture, right? We think of this as, you know, corporate means white. Corporate means sort of this this very formalized way of talking. Um, but it happens in all cultures. the The other thing that I wanted to address is why do we do it, right? Why do we, you know? Uh, have a have our own way of code switching, right? And why do we do that? Well, we're, when we're in our comfortable place, typically, and we're talking in a mainstream, right, or this sort of def default language, it might we might not fit in if we don't code switch, right? It's about how do we integrate into that what we've defined as the mainstream, right, or the dominant culture, right? But sometimes when we code switch within that mainstream we're doing it as a way to say something in secret right so there in some of the language of code switching there may be words that we say and you know urban language right if we talk about urban language there's words that come out all the time that mainstream communicators don't know right um and and we think about some of the things that we do right so it's as simple as the handshake or the you know the what's up you know how's it going the dab the exactly all of that exactly right so it's all of that that we do that you know eventually we'll get to some mainstream but when you think about corporate it it tends to stay very very generic and very very um basic and it, and and we might find some things happening here or there uh that are um that where the where the code switching then gets brought into the mainstream that is very interesting uh the fact that on a language level, it was about all the other sub languages kind of bowing down and deferring to English. And in the same manner, all of the individuals within a corporation uh, environment, all of the individuals who represent those, let's just say subculture or non-European, right? The dominant culture, again, the sort of have to, have to find a way to bend themselves to to fit that mold, which is very interesting. Yeah, very it interesting is. Put that. It is. And and, yeah. and so here, go ahead, Rambi. I think you wanted to jump in there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say another term that I heard people use is shedding your blackness when it comes to code mm -hmm. switching. And I experienced that. Uh, you mentioned culture. And I and Javier and I come, comes from, we come from a football culture. So I got a rude awakening when I went to corporate America and realize in order for me to get a seat at the table, I have to code switch. And uh, because you always hear people like you have to show that you have executive presence, that you have to speak a certain way, or act a certain way, or look a certain way to get a seat at the table. Am I correct in that, Sal? Yeah, I think you and I talked about this earlier. And yeah. Randy, based on the increase uh, in awareness and people speaking up, especially during the discourse these past few weeks, and they're really beginning to enact change across America and companies are beginning to step up. I think we all agree that silence is complicity and people are beginning to really voice their opinions. What do you think? Is it time for corporate America to really reimagine and recalibrate the expectations of executive presence? Or in other words, does the phrase um, he or she doesn't look corporate. Should that be stricken from, from our vernacular and really kind of reassessed and this is a good time to start now? So the short answer to that for all of you and, and Sal thinks I think it's a very thoughtful question, but the short answer is yes. We're, you know, we, we need to be able to do that. And, and here's why, right? Um, when we think about, when we talk about inclusion and diversity, right? The, if you think about some of the things that we have struggled with as a, as a corporate entity around diversity and inclusion, it's been around how do we, like when we close our eyes and we ask ourselves to envision a CEO, right, or a corporate vice president, and we say, what does that person look like in your mind? 
for most people, that's a white man, right? But what we've realized, right, and what many corporations have come to realize is that in order for us, the, co the corporate entity, to, to expand its opportunity to sell products and services, there are many billions of dollars available to people who are not white and male right or white period right there's there's lots of demographic groups that have money to spend and if you want them to spend money within your um, products and services in your organization then you have to start to reflect what that looks like so what what sort of things did we start to see we started to see you know um, issues of diversity right so people just people who look different came in but then and, and very recently we had the issue of hair right? And about black women hair, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what's an appropriate hairstyle, right? Is it straight and looking very much like white females? Or is it more natural and looking more like black females normally look, right? And, and so, so the corporate America has gotten to the place and, and it's been nudged along, and I would say probably a little bit more than nudged along by black females who have said, I'm going to wear my hair differently. I think that when you look at the influence of urban culture, right, and if you look at how our country in a, in a pop culture and a, a sort of American culture way, how much black culture is exported out to the rest of the world and how much of black culture becomes part of mainstream culture, the notion of um, Ebonics or code, or let's, so let's hold on to Ebonics for a minute. The notion of sounding black or using black dialect, right, has become mainstream in some ways, right? When you think of words in music, when you think about words in communication, and you think about how it gets adopted by mainstream culture, right? And then, you know, urban culture is still always evolving. If you think about code switching, some of that behavior. Right. Some of that behavior makes it into the mainstream and it doesn't indicate anything around intellect or capability. And so I think that the more you start to see corporations go from this sort of high archical ivory tower to more of this flat organization with younger people stepping into roles and you see more influence of technology, you're going to have those influences around code switching coming in. And so you're probably going to see more prevalence of people who don't code switch when they're in the job. It's funny you say that because uh, I experienced this and this is more of an implicit bias that, you know, you deal with in a corporate co culture. And when uh, you talk about our, our culture and our language is worldwide and people want to adapt to it. So when you go to the office one day, and somebody will come up to you and talk to you and speak to you a certain way because they feel like, well, you're black, you must talk this way. But if I was to come and do that at the office, I'm considered a thug, I'm gangster, or, or I, I can't speak proper English. That's so a, it's funny that you said. <laughs> I'll go ahead, good, Avi. That, that's a very good point. Uh, I'll be interested in, in, uh, in what you guys think about this. I, I totally know the the um the encounter that you're describing Rondi. i'm sure we all yeah. have kind of experienced that on some level or another now so we're talking about um a, a perceived minority fitting into a perceived majority by way by different ways and means of changing how they speak changing how they look but you're describing how someone from the perceived minority engages with someone from the perceived minority right so when that happens, is that, do you all think that that's that individual trying to empathize or trying to connect with you on your level? Or is that like straight patronizing, just maybe a little un uncomfortable or a little awkward, not knowing kind of what to say to the, to the so-called black guy in the office? What do y'all think about well, that? I'll, Interesting. I, well, I, go, I always took it as they, yeah, they're trying to relate. And I get it, but when you go too far with it, that's when I it's kind of like you said, it's it's kind of uneasy. Like you're you're trying too hard to relate with me and get to know me. And I were you know this, Javier. We respect, especially when you play football. We got it the most when we play football. You respect the people the most when they act on their authentic way. Like they they come and act the way that they normally act around somebody else. 
So me personally, it kind of rubbed me the wrong way, but I always chopped it up as, okay, he's just trying to relate and he's trying to get along with me. Mm. And I can respect yeah. that. Being, being the only non-black guy here, um, I think early on in my career, it's just that. I was trying to be empathetic. I wanted to fit in, if you will, with the, with the, the folks that I was meeting. But then I'd catch myself thinking, gosh, that's probably offensive. That's not normally the way I would naturally talk. And so I made a very cognizant um, realization and made sure that I didn't do that. And when I met you guys, obviously, it was just my authentic self. I think it's just um, uh, a, a, a reaction that a lot of folks, not, not everyone, but a lot of folks who try to um, relate. It's an easy way to relate. It is sort of a ubiquitous thing now is to try to uh, relate, especially in, in Ebonics, if you will, and just the way they want to be accepted by, uh, by, by folks. Uh, certainly not right. But um, I think it's an subconsciously the folks do that without actually realizing it. it. It happened to me quite a bit. I have to catch myself. So, um, it, you know, I think this is worth talking about because it, it brings realization. And I think people are more aware of that. Yeah. So, so one of the things that, that, that I can tell you, which was interesting as I was preparing for this conversation, um, you know, I, I fit into the black guy that was not black enough for the black crowd sometimes. And I was too black for the white crowd. And so there's a little bit of how do you adapt and where do you do? And I grew up, you know, in Brooklyn, New York, and I grew up, you know, in, 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 a, in an area with Southern parents, by the way, who, you know, that code switching for me happened all through my life, where day to day during the school year, for nine months of the year, it wasn't about, you know, being with my black friends or being with my black because there weren't many black friends in my life growing up but when i was in you know in the south with my family in the summertime i was with all my southern black family and that's where i learned right that blackness right and i learned all about that and so i didn't realize i was code switching right until i got much older and my code switching wasn't going into a corporate situation and sounding different because that was my normal. My code switching was when I got around my frat brothers or I got around my black brothers, you know, my frat black, you know, my Sigma brothers and getting around them and then being able, you know, to be more me. Right. And so I code switched black when I got around my black <laughs> brothers, but I, every, every other time it was always kind of this guy that people were going, well, you know, he does, he seems kind of white, right? Well, that was my orientation. So my code switching was kind of reverse code switching, you know, when I, when I was um, looking at my social situations or corporate. This is definitely a treat having you here. Sorry, Rondi. Uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. This is definitely a treat having you here. Talk with us about this, Randy. We know that you have been in, uh, in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space for many years in many different uh, industries. So you're, um, you are uh, as a subject matter expert on things of this nature and your perspective, can you, can you offer some, some light or, or shed some perspective on how, like the how, right? How do we flatten that curve within corporate America? Is it, is it something that the, again, the quote, uh, so-called dominant culture, is that element going to have to change something? Or is it the individuals who may not visually or automatically fit within that, again, stereotypical dominant culture? Is that group going to have to do something different? How do you, how do you see that playing out? So th there's, a couple, there's a couple of things, a great question, right? So there's a couple of things. What is going to be the driver for change? Right. Is it going to be that black people in corporate America stop code switching because that becomes a thing? Right. That's important. Mm -hmm. Or is there a benefit to having a way to communicate more quickly? Right. Or in a more um, common way so that the communication doesn't get cross wires. Right. So the, 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 the what I'm saying is by code switching right we we are now putting ourselves in the environment with the mainstream organization or the mainstream people right the mainstream population and we find ourselves 
using the code switching from, say, our comfortable ethnic orientation to then sort of a mainstream as a way to fit in, as a way to um, shortcut our communication so that there's no confusion. And I think that the question becomes, is it about fitting in? Is it about shortcutting communications, right? And making sure that we don't have to spend so much time explaining what this word means in my community. You know, when I use it, this is what I mean. So Mm -hmm. let me slow down and catch you up, right? But rather, let me just come to you because it's faster, right? Let me just speak your way because it's quicker. Let me just speak your way because we can avoid all this, oh, I'm so enlightened and now tell me more about, oh, can I touch your hair? No, I mean, you know, it, it becomes, it's not, I'm not here to educate you. I'm not here to do, I'm here to get work done and it needs to be done fast. It needs to be done efficiently. And if that's the default, code switching will always be a thing, right? And, and we will stay in our comfort zone when we're around our people. But when we get into a mainstream situation, if we decide that there's a push for, primarily from minority people and per, particularly, you know, black people, who are coming in and saying, I'm not code switching, right? I think that that's going to be, that's going to be driven because there's an activist movement towards that. Mm -hmm. I think what we might see are black people in white environments when they get two or three together, code switching black, right? Going back to that, that black way and not toning it down when white, when they're in that corporate hallway or in that corporate cafeteria. Right. They continue to con- to communicate in a comfortable way and they don't switch it up. Right. But I don't see that, you know, unless there's a movement, I just don't see that people are going to change from where they are today. Mm. Uh, real quick in our in our uh, Randy, in our uh, our research meeting, one of our research meetings for this episode, we had uh, tooled around with the concept that. Uh, code switching, as we are talking about it now, within a defined corporate environment where there is a defined dominant culture, um, we kind of tooled around with code switching being uh, a form of overcompensation. Would you would you agree with that? Would you think that that has some relevance to it? So, say more about that. When you say overcompensating, overcompensating in what way? Well, uh, so that there is a perceived uh, gap between whoever is in the dominant culture in that corporation at the time and the inv- individual who does not fit within that dominant culture. Do you believe that them using whatever tactic to code switch to assimilate, to get closer to that dominant culture, could, could you identify any of that activity as some form of overcompensation? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think that, um, you know, so so, just you know, to be very vulnerable right here, I, you know, there there have been times when, you know, I've been accused right of trying to be too white or trying to be too because that's just sort of you know what I've what I grew up with, especially in the South. I mean, if you grew up in the North and you don't have a Southern accent, when you go to the South and you sound you know like you don't have any of that you know um, that way, especially with a Northern accent, you know, you're gonna you're gonna get accused of that, and then people might say you're overcompensating. I think that if, uh, you know, when I was thinking about this, one of the funny examples that came up with uh, in my mind was the uh, in the Beverly Hills cop when uh, uh, Eddie Murphy came up upon the black officer who had did the banana in the tailpipe. Right. <laughs> and, he, and he I mean, it was a it was a perfect example of code switching. Right. It was a perfect example of a black guy that was overcompensating. Right. For for uh, trying to fit into the white culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I think that. I, I hope that people recognize that, but uh, you know, I and, and I would hope that people uh, would not look at that person as trying to overcompensate as opposed to just trying really hard to fit in. Um, but I, I wish that you know culturally we would try and, and understand that there's you know on a, that, that you know there is that language, but to tr- and to try to fit in is fine, but trying to overcompensate. Is just going to, I mean, in my opinion, it's just going to reflect poorly. Hmm. It's a great what perspective. Think, uh, this, this topic, I mean, it, it's so, uh, we can go on forever on this topic. Um, you know, hopefully this discussion has raised some questions uh, from both the corporate and an individual perspective. 
just for, just hearing you speak, uh, it it often makes me feel sad, if you will, that it seems like the culpability to change it is on the individuals versus also the companies, you know, corporate America. And I think it's incumbent upon companies to really open their eyes and and um, address this issue because otherwise it's just placing the onus and the responsibility on the individual who are mostly affected. And unless you said there's a movement, I think it's um, it's it's for lack of a better term unfair. Yeah. Well, one of the things, Sal, let me just throw this in from a diversity and inclusion perspective. We always talk about trying to create an environment where people can bring their whole selves to work. But, you know, and we say that all the time. We want people to bring your whole selves to work. Right. Well, you know, from my experience, some people need to leave some of that at home. Right. But until we're really ready to for people to bring and truly bring their whole selves to work. I don't know that code switching is going to be something that when you think about all the other issues that we've got out there to deal with, that code switching is going to bubble up to be one of the more critical ones. I think that one is just going to either sneak up on us and it's just going to be something that people accept, or it's never going to be something that people accept. Hmm. I think it's a start. This conversation in and of itself is a start and hopefully that uh, raises some awareness. And um, we certainly appreciate you joining us uh, for this is uh, our inaugural uh, episode in terms of having a guest, and uh, we certainly appreciate it. Um, we like to end our episodes with what we call a dope recommendation of reading. And, um, you know, is there a book that inspires you, that makes you think that things differently, an approach? It doesn't necessarily have to be about code switching, but just something that's uh, inspirational to you. Yeah, so... Um... I don't know if I'm going to call it inspirational. It pretty much made me angry. The, the, and, and as I read it and read through the data and got educated about our American history, it was very, very frustrating to read. But Michelle Alexander, who is a terrific uh, attorney and worked um, you know, in the, um, in the judicial system, wrote a book called The New Jim Crow. And it talks about things like mass incarceration and sort of the evolution of Jim Crow laws in the, in the country. And it starts, you know, from, you know, slave days till today. Um, and there's, it, it's mostly, it's not, a, it, there are stories in it, but it's mostly about data and statistics and an explanation of how we've gotten to the, the, the systems of law that we have today that have been set up um, to, um, to the disadvantage of black and brown men. And, uh, and so this is, it's a, it's an incredibly hard book to read if you're really caught up in, in the unfairness that our country has, uh, has, has uh, created in terms of the judicial system and the bias against black and brown men. But it is very enlightening. It's very data driven, right? So it's not someone's opinion. Um, and uh, it, it, it's very enlightening. It, it's, it's a powerful book, but, but it's, uh, it's one that I have had a hard time getting through because it's frustrating to read. Good job. And that's yeah, uh, Michelle with... Alexander. Michelle Alexander, the new Jim Crow. The Jim Crow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are we giving our book, Sal? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a book. Uh, well, I have two recommendations, but I'm only going to talk about one. The Hate You Give is a movie that you should watch. And the book you should read is kind of along the lines of what uh, my good friend Randy just said. It's, it's called How to Be an Anti-Racist. And it's basically, it goes back to the slave days, how racist ideas and racist policies were built to put people that look like Javier, Randy and I in jail. And one of the racist ideas he talked about is this idea of what you're talking white or you're talking black. That's not a thing. You talk where you grew up at. You talk like where you grew up at. And it's not a black or white thing. And he was saying that's one of the racist ideas is to make people seem different, like black on black crime. That's not a thing. There's just something a way to dehumanize black people. But it's a good read. I recommend people to read that uh, on uh, the book, How to Be a Rank, uh, Anti-Racist. It's, it's written by Ingram Kennedy. Ingram Kennedy. I think All right, that's I'll, I'll thing. I know it's a great read. Um, one book that I like, it's, uh, it's called We Are All Sales People. So we are all sales, comma, people. Uh, it's by Brett Kierstead. Uh, in all transparency, he's a, a former boss of mine uh, years ago, a good friend, a good mentor. 
And it's an amalgamation, it's a consolidation of stories uh, that he's accumulated over the years in his work and life experience to help improve and optimize communication at work, home, and in school. So it's really relevant to all ages. Um, a lot of these are stories that uh, he and I used to talk about when we were on road trips, when we were on business trips. We would get in some really deep conversations about certain topics, and a lot of these are anecdotal and, and also just examples of the conversations that he's had with several of individuals uh, in his life and business and in his personal life. It's a great, easy read, but it's also just a nice, uplifting, you know, uh, inspirational thing with everything going on. I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing to uh, to read something you know, positive. So that's my, my uh, recommendation. Absolutely, fellas. And for anyone who can look out their window or look into whatever screen they get their daily, daily content from, can see clear as day that the world that we live in is not the world that we knew. Um, the world is changing. The world has changed. And um, once a once a uh, wise uh, a wise person will say once said to me is that um, to be the change that you want to see in the world. <clears throat> that was a very profound statement when I first heard it. So uh, now is the time for us to care for each other and love each other. And uh, we here at uh, the Dope Experience, uh, caring and sharing. So uh, my share for the day is, uh, yeah, we're talking about corporate settings and there is a definitely a formula to having success inside of a corporation. Um, the book that breaks this down the best for me, is called The First 90 Days by uh, Michael Watkins. Uh, he gives an actual formula for anyone interested in how to navigate uh, any kind of transition within a corporate environment. In addition to whatever code switching that may or may not be uh, a topic in, in your transition. So definitely, definitely, definitely recommend checking uh, that book or any of the other books that these guys shared with you um, going forward. So we're good to go, Sal. Excellent. Randy Wilson, yeah. thank you, sir, for joining us. Uh, very pleasure. insightful. Thank you for thank your you, friendship. Randy. Appreciate you, Randy. Now to everybody that's out there listening, now it's time for you to go be dope and give hope because that's what we need in this world today. Y'all take care. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of The Dope Experience. Our hope is that you're left with a new perspective to formulate a blueprint of growth and transformation. Make sure you subscribe to us on Spotify or wherever you consume podcasts. Stay dope.